Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Engineering Energy Systems for a Climate Crisis. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. So this is a Zoom webinar, and therefore all attendee videos and microphones have been disabled. However, you do have the option to ask a question by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. So while questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, um, we highly encourage you to type them as they come to mind into the Q&A box on your screen. So you do not need to wait until the question and answer period to submit your question. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please be mindful that with a high volume of questions, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. So you, you may also use the chat box on your screen to talk amongst each other and share ideas. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to Carlton's YouTube channel. And finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, a brief survey will appear on the screen. So if you do have the time to fill it out, uh, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. So all answers are anonymous. So now I am pleased to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Ahmed Abdullah. Professor Abdullah joined Carleton University's Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering faculty on July 1st, 2020. His research investigates energy system design for deep decarbonization. Professor Abdullah co-leads the Alternative Pathways for the Energy Transition, or APEX, research group at Carleton University devoted to accelerating the transition to a deeply decarbonized energy system in Canada and across the world in order to avert the worst consequences of climate change. Prior to joining Carleton, Professor Abdullah was an assistant research professor in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today, Professor Abdullah will discuss energy system design in this radically new context, presenting results from recent research on the role of unproven technologies like direct air capture of carbon dioxide and carbon capture, utilization, and storage. He will conclude by discussing how his research group at Carleton University is working to develop a new generation of energy system models that integrate real world challenges to energy deployment. Thank you, Professor Abdullah, for joining us today. And now I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm going to assume that I'm audible unless someone tells me otherwise. And I'd like to thank you all for your attendance today and for the introduction, Laura. My goal in this presentation is twofold. The first is to convey a sense of urgency regarding the scale of the challenge that we have before us. That scale is actually now so large that we need radical energy transition pathways to help us avert the worst consequences of climate change. Today, I'll be discussing two potentially vital arrows in our quiver as this transition unfolds. The first is the direct capture of carbon dioxide from ambient air, which is called direct air capture or DAC. The second is fixing a ship that is taking on water, and that ship is carbon capture and storage, or CCS. Even though I emphasize urgencies throughout this talk, I still acknowledge that decision-making at speed is never sensible, and it is precisely in situations like these, urgent ones, where we could end up making really dreadful mistakes. So this talk is an invitation to discuss radical energy transition pathways, debate their intended and unintended effects, and to try and mitigate their greatest risks. My second goal is to argue for a new generation of large scale energy system models that put improved representations of reality at their heart by integrating human behavior and political economy. In fact, as engineers, I would, I would argue that we of all professionals are particularly suited to modeling the world as it is, not how the world perhaps ought to look like according to our judgments. And I motivate this talk and indeed most of my talks with these two figures that you see. On the left are a set of global emissions trajectories modeled from today to the end of the century. Net annual CO2 emissions are on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. Each of these many emission trajectories that you see 
is the product of individual model runs generated by global climate and energy models. And these models are designed to target a specific level of global warming, which is defined as the increase above global mean surface temperatures in the latter half of the 19th century. You can see that the runs are grouped into four clusters by color. So you have the red cluster denoting a rise of about three to about five and a half degrees Celsius. That happens to be the trajectory we're currently on. And then there's a safer trajectory denoted in blue with a rise of one to two and a half degrees Celsius. And that's the trajectory we need to stabilize the climate. And not just uh, the, according to scientists, but at levels that are enshrined in international climate accords like the Paris Agreement. And the starkest thing about this figure is that getting from red to blue, in other words, getting on the safe trajectory requires dipping into net negative emissions territory. In other words, it's quaint to talk about net zero at this moment. We've waited so long to begin the energy transition that some of these models can only solve for the Paris goals if we spend years or perhaps decades in this territory below zero global emissions. And the graph on the right really brings home this point. If we had started mitigating emissions in the year 2000 after the Kyoto Protocol was signed, then we would have faced a steep and expensive decarbonization process, mitigation rates of about 3% per year. But that pathway is really peanuts compared to the one we're currently on. And so this figure reveals the cost of an action really, and it's designed to terrify engineers because at some point, and no one really knows what, where that point is, we won't be physically able to deploy and integrate enough low carbon infrastructure for decarbonization without relaxing or blowing our targets or um, wildly overshooting them and then overcorrecting. And in reality, of course, overshooting could mean abandoning certain cities, it could mean species ex extinction or habitat loss, and it could mean risking other climatic and natural tipping points. And that is exactly why the dialogue on climate policy is shifting away from measured policy designs and towards warnings of emergency. You have many national governments, many local administrative units, and many scientists making formal declarations of a crisis and demanding a crisis response that is akin to wartime mobilization. We still have multiple competing visions for what that deep decarbonization would look like. But as the grave reality sets in, broad consensus has emerged on a few things. For example, you'd be hard pressed to find analysts who don't want this large green chunk here, a broad portfolio of low carbon electricity generation technologies. And they want these even as the debate rages about the role of specific technologies in that mix like nuclear power. Another point of consensus is that some sectors of the global economy can't be electrified, either technically or cost-effectively. As a result, we'll have to keep using liquid and gaseous fuels in some sectors like aviation, agriculture, maybe industry, and even some power generation. And to make up for that fact, we will have to engage in large-scale carbon removal. So how might that carbon removal be achieved in practice? There are five classes of negative emissions technologies or nets to remove carbon from the atmosphere. One is called terrestrial carbon removal. This basically means reforestation, changes in agriculture, things of that like. There is coastal blue carbon, which is sustaining or re-engineering mangroves and wetlands so that they suck more carbon out of the atmosphere. You have bioenergy with carbon capture, this involves generating electricity from existing or newly converted biomass sources. And then you have enhanced weathering, which is large scale mineralization to trap CO2. I focus on the fifth class, which is direct air capture of carbon dioxide. These are engineered systems, in other words, they're machines that are designed to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And the problem with all of these nets, as they're called, is that betting on carbon removal when we haven't yet demonstrated it at scale is foolhardy. Analysts ought to be humble by now because in previous energy transitions, we have evidence of technologies that overpromised and underdelivered. Nuclear power a few decades ago, carbon capture and storage more recently. At the same time, analysts don't really want to ditch the two degree target that science tells us is safe and that took so long for policymakers to accept. As a result, global climate and energy models have latched onto nets 
as a last resort to stabilize the climate. So they deploy existing technologies to the extent they can. And then the gap between your emission trajectory and your emission target becomes a responsibility of nets to meet. As you can imagine, this is very dangerous and the modelers themselves argue that the deployment potential of nets remains largely unknown and that relying on them to force the models to converge to two degrees is dangerous. This is why my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, Texas A&M and I recently published a study that outlines what large scale carbon removal through DAC might look like. So if we do get serious about climate change now, and if we begin an aggressive DAC emergency deployment program, how much CO2 can we realistically remove by, remove by the end of the century? How would that affect global warming? How much would it cost? How much energy would it require? And finally, how would the program's cost and performance change as the political structure of the program changes? Because there are multiple theories in international relations for how such an emergency effort might unfold. And in answering these questions, we build an integrated modeling framework that makes three novel contributions. First, most, but not all of the literature is currently focused on individual DAC systems, often because it's authored by the engineers developing these technologies. And the assumptions used in these studies often differ, which means configurations are not being evaluated in an integrated comparative assessment. And that is what we choose to undertake here. Second, DAC is quite energy intensive. The systems need both, both electricity and heat to run. And these can be provided in many ways, as we know. Existing research, especially if it's authored by engineers advocating for their chosen configuration, opts for the most cost-effective energy source. In fact, some studies assume the energy can be provided at zero cost. And instead of doing that, this research compares the performance of DAC systems that are powered by a wide range of energy sources. Third and finally, the literature has assumed that DAC will scale up to meet a large but arbitrary target like 10 gigatons of CO2 removal per year. Instead of adopting that approach, this research grounds plausible DAC expansion rates in the logic of climate policy and international relations. And I'm now going to take you through each of these three contributions briefly, starting with the DAC systems themselves. There are two main DAC system configurations that have been deployed at pilot scale, and they differ appreciably. The first on the left here is a high temperature DAC system or HD DAC system. It has two main components, an air contactor and a regeneration facility. In the air contactor, carbon dioxide and ambient air reacts with an aqueous solution to produce a carbonate. The carbonate is then fed to the regeneration facility where several process steps take place to regenerate the aqueous solution and liberate a stream of high purity CO2 that can then be compressed and fed into a CO2 pipeline or utilized on site if possible. And it's called an HT DAC system because one of the process steps, this oxygen fired calciner that converts calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and CO2 requires process heat at a temperature of about 900 degrees Celsius. The company developing and demonstrating the system is Carbon Engineering. It's Canadian and it's based in British Columbia. The second system is a low temperature DAC system or LT DAC system. And this involves an adsorption desorption process. First, a ventilator drives ambient air through a CO2 collector where CO2 is bound to the adsorbent. When the collector can't bind any more CO2, we move to the desorption phase where CO2 is released through a vacuum, vacuum temperature swing and at a heat below 100 degrees Celsius. And that's when the libera liberated CO2 can be compressed and transported. And the main company developing this system is called Climeworks and it's based in Switzerland. Both systems utilize electricity and heat to operate and these can be provided in many ways. We develop 98 unique system configurations that represent all plausible combinations of electricity and heat, but not all combinations are possible. As far as heat is concerned, we have limited options. In addition to natural gas combustion, we can build high temperature DAC systems that use hydrogen or electricity to provide that 900 degrees Celsius heat you need. The low temperature DAC system can also rely on natural gas combustion but because it operates at sub 100 degrees Celsius temperatures, 
waste heat and heat pumps could possibly provide the energy required as well. Most of the electricity sources we considered are anchored in power systems that exist today. So Quebec's hydropower heavy grid is an example. Ontario's nuclear heavy grid is another example, grids with low cost electricity, relatively. California's renewable plus gas grid was another example that we tested. Other examples we considered are plausible but don't exist yet, like a power grid that is powered by natural gas power plants with carbon capture and sequestration systems bolted on them. Finally, we devised three expansion scenarios for direct air capture. And these three scenarios are rooted in the logic of international cooperation, crisis decision-making, and wartime deployment. The first of these scenarios involves unilateral action by one rich country. In our case, we consider the US, but you, can, you could consider the EU or China as well. And they would dedicate 5% of their GDP to this program. And we root this astronomically large figure, perhaps, in data from previous mobilizations. I'd like to note for those of you who think 5% is excessive, that, US, that the US's current military expenditure is between three and 4% of GDP. So it is excessive, but previous mobilizations have matched this and exceeded it even in certain years. The second scenario involves collaboration among a small club of countries. And this is rooted in the logic that all successful inter international collaboration begins with small clubs of countries working together and then expands to more countries. Here we consider the club of democracies that form the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or the OECD. The OECD's 36 members in this case would contribute to the DAC program at the same proportion as they contribute to the OECD budget with the US's contribution anchoring everyone else's at 5% of its GDP. And the third and final scenario is global cooperation. This is a war-like scenario. And here we assume that the appropriation is delivered by the community of nations working together in the same proportion as their contribution to the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is the loan offering arm of the World Bank. And so these three scenarios generate enormous appropriations of between one and $1.6 trillion annually. Now you might ask if the reality of climate change sets in and countries mobilize to mitigate emissions, why would they focus on DAC rather than wind power or another technology? And my response would be that DAC is actually a rather attractive emergency scenario. Because if we do arrive at that tipping point and enormous resources are free to address climate change and collaboration is imperative, we would like scenarios or technologies that, are, that, that result in verifiable emissions reductions. And with DAC, you can precisely measure the amount of carbon being removed without getting into discussions about carbon offsets or marginal emissions. So you could argue that DAC's benefits are more verifiable and that verification happens to be key to success in most fields of international collaboration, from ozone protection to arms control. That brings us to our integrated modeling framework. For each possible configuration that we test, we deploy our first plant in year one, which is 2025 in our case. We ground the cost and performance of our first of a kind plant in estimates from the literature. Similarly, the appropriation available in year one and indeed in each year can be readily calculated. We enforce a maximum industry-wide growth rate of 20% per year, which we take from past assessments of growth rates during wartime mobilization. We acknowledge that this parameter is highly uncertain and indeed we vary it to assess its impact on CO2 removal. All of this tells us how many new plants could be built in any time step, whether the number of new plants is constrained by industry growth rates or appropriation, and eventually how many old plants need to be retired and replaced. And we repeat this process for each time step with more deployment leading to more technological learning until the final time step is reached. And at that point, we calculate fleet aggregated performance parameters. We also have a vector of net CO2 removals per year and we feed that vector into a carbon cycle model to determine the impact of the entire DAC deployment program 
on atmospheric CO2 concentrations and global warming. As you can see, the analysis is quite interdisciplinary. The appropriation logic comes from political science and international relations. System performance comes from engineering and the modeling comes from engineering. And the carbon cycle model comes from atmospheric climate science. With that, I'll now present two key results from this research. First, this graph shows you the ranges of net CO2 removal per year for all 294 scenarios under investigation. And that is why the ranges are so broad. The scenarios are grouped based on the appropriation that is available. So we have unilateral US action in green, obviously the least amount of money, therefore resulting in the least emissions reductions. And then we have in orange, cooperation among the club of democracies and cooperation worldwide in blue. We look at two worlds and two evolutions of our world. And these evolutions are based on the world we have now. They're called, the scenarios are based on what's called the shared socioeconomic pathway two or SSP two. I'm not going to discuss that extensively now, but basically this corresponds in the global climate modeling literature to a middle of the road transition where we don't run even faster into carbon, but we don't get really aggressive about mitigation or changes to innovation structures, for example. And the marker scenario basically is our current trajectory. It sees substantial temperature increases as a result of an action on decarbonization. Whereas the 4.5 scenario is that aggressive mitigation scenario that is in line with the two degree goal that we all have. And you'll notice in this graph that even a crash program results in only modest amounts of removal in the first few decades. The removals don't deviate much from the black line, which is the case without DAC. It's only when the technology matures and diffuses and we can utilize all of that appropriation that DAC really explodes onto the scene and can achieve substantial levels of removal. And this is common in technological transitions. The implication is that near-term deployment, the first few decades, is imperative to getting over the initial industry-wide scaling constraints. And that's what we need to do. Moreover, this carbon removal could actually help remediate the atmosphere. So DAC alone, if we don't change our energy system and just remove carbon, slows global warming or reduces it by the end of the century by about 0.5 degrees Celsius. But you can see in the best case scenario where we couple the most aggressive DAC program with the most aggressive deep decarbonization scenario, we actually end up partially reversing global warming. But that's assuming that we're simultaneously doing both and dedicating trillions of dollars to both. And so the implication here is that DAC is an important arrow in the quiver, but it's by no means an easy fix to climate change. And it's by no means an excuse not to engage in energy system decarbonization independent of DAC. In fact, we need both if we want to stabilize the climate at the levels that are enshrined in our international agreements. What about the system-wide implications of emergency DAC deployment? We have quite a few studies on DAC. They've assessed the energy requirements of these systems, but they failed to put those requirements in context. Our research does that by calculating the energy required from the natural gas system on the y-axis and the electricity system on the x-axis that accompanies each of the unique DAC system configurations that we investigate. And we compare those requirements with the energy needs in both natural gas and electricity terms of the US, of the OECD Club of Democracies, and of the world as a whole in the year 2017. And we can develop figures like these for every time step in our model. I'm choosing to show you the 2075 graph here. This is the time by which DAC system deployment has really taken off. And I'm asking you to ignore the symbols and to ignore the legend and just to focus on the colors for now. The green markers represent the high temperature DAC systems that rely on natural gas combustion. 
for their process heat requirements. And you can see that even in the best case scenarios, we're talking about building a natural gas infrastructure to power these tax systems. That is the size of the OECD's natural gas system in 2017. So this is building a parallel infrastructure dedicated solely to these plants. And if we go to the purple and blue um, dots here, which are the hydrogen fired and electric high temperature DAC systems, their electricity use is so intensive that in some cases we're talking about a several fold expansion in the world's entire electric power system. And so the implication here is that even the most promising DAC system designs suggest a carbon removal enterprise on the scale of the current energy system. And so the notion of this being an easy fix is quite foolhardy. In conclusion for this part of the presentation, this research presents the first integrated comparative assessment of the universe of potential DAC system designs. It considers system performance across a range of attributes, including cost, emissions, and the system-wide implications for our natural gas and electric power grids. And a crash course in DAC deployment we find can contribute to our climate goals. And in the best cases, it can actually partially reverse global warming. But that's only possible if it's accompanied by aggressive and deep decarbonization of the energy system. Without that aggressive and deep decarbonization, DAC itself cannot stop warming at two degrees, even if we spend $1.6 trillion a year on it. And of course, this requires a commitment to building a parallel infrastructure on the scale of the current energy system, which is mammoth. More immediately, our problem is scale up. Scale up takes decades, even in wartime mobilization scenarios, which means we need to start now. And we need to start perhaps with less than ideal scenarios or configurations. For example, DAC systems that run on natural gas. That would allow us to begin the process of technological learning and ramp up manufacturing. We also need extensive research, not only on the fundamentals of DAC, but also on the system integration side, which is where a lot of new technologies fail, including life cycle implications and the effect of DAC on other attributes that are important to us, other than carbon dioxide emissions, like land use. Now you might ask, why on earth would we remove carbon dioxide out of the Earth's atmosphere where its concentration is 400 parts per million, instead of simply capturing it from the exhaust gases of large point sources of carbon pollution, like power plants. After all, those facilities are already in highly industrialized locations. We don't need to despoil more land. They have their own utility infrastructure, and it's cheaper to extract CO2 from fluid streams in which its concentration is higher. And my response would be, you're absolutely right. The technology to capture and sequester carbon has existed for decades. decade. It's called carbon capture and sequestration or CCS. And it's responsible for capturing around 30 million tons of CO2 across the world today, every year. Unfortunately, that is a tiny fraction of what has been proposed as a role for CCS in an energy transition. And in fact, we have not managed to successfully execute many CCS projects in our, um, across the world, not just in North America. I recently went back to the largest database of CCS projects that have been proposed and executed. And I calculated the proportion of CCS projects that have been successfully completed in different sectors of our energy system. The first wave of carbon capture projects happened actually in the early 70s for tertiary uh, oil recovery. And it stretched all the way to the early 2000s. And it was mainly carbon capture from gas processing facilities, which you see here in light blue. And among that cluster or that subset of carbon capture projects, the success rate for implementation has been about 70%. And most of them are still capturing carbon today and selling that carbon into established CO2 markets across the world. Unfortunately, the record of CCS deployment in other sectors like the industrial sector or the power sector is pathetic. And in the case of the power sector, which is shown here in the darkest gray and shown here in the darkest blue, the success rate is less than 10%. And that's where we need to deploy CCS on fossil fuel power plants, whether it's in North America or in India and China. 
And this failure of hundreds of CCS projects comes despite extensive support from government and industry. Moreover, the reasons for failure that are usually offered are singular. So some people blame public opposition to fossil development. Others say CO2 doesn't have a market, so why would we capture it? Other developers still decry the fact that these investments are billion dollar investments and they're lumpy. In other words, the capital costs dominate and you need to spend those billions before you see a dime of return. And of course, these are all partially true. With a group of colleagues, I decided to go beyond the singular explanations for success and failure and to analyze the full universe of CCS projects ever attempted in the US for which we could find documentation. And this turned out to be the largest sample ever studied. And it helped us turn these singular explanations for success and failure into a systematic assessment of the reasons for success and failure. It turned out that this was not an easy endeavor to begin. It required three years of data collection, starting with an elaboration of all the reasons that have been blamed for failure or credited for the success of CCS projects. We started by reaching out to half a dozen experts who were in that cauldron, who were intimately involved with success and failure in the CCS space. We also scoured company financial statements, we read news articles, and we read publications that provided case studies of successful or failed projects. And we eventually settled on 12 distinct attributes or independence variables. Each of these could lead to success or failure to some degree. And so we developed scoring scales for each of these variables, and we deployed those scoring scales on all of the projects for which we could find data. And so once we had scored these projects, we built two independent statistical models to explore the relationship between those independent variables and between our dependence variable, which was project outcome. And the last step of this process was to understand that data often lie, or at least omit important variables. And that is why we conducted a structured elicitation of expert judgment, the goal of which was to generate yet another model not based on the empirical data for why these projects might succeed or fail. And the reason we turn to the experts in this case is because most of the knowledge about success and failure doesn't exist in textbooks or laboratories. It exists in the minds of professional engineers who managed these billion dollar projects and saw them succeed or saw them fail over the past few decades. We ended up considering 39 CCS projects in the US. And we omitted projects for one reason only, which was where the data was not complete. I mentioned that we considered 12 independent variables. You see them here. These fell into four clusters ranging from engineering economics to financial credibility to political economic factors, things like public opposition and regulatory uncertainty. Some of these attributes like technology readiness level or capital cost have been extensively analyzed in previous literature. Others like credibility of incentives and credibility of revenues have not even been properly defined, let alone analyzed. So for example, incentives are credible if they are durable rather than brittle, if they are upfront rather than delayed, and if they are unconditional rather than conditional. Whereas revenues are credible when there's a predictable, reliable source of revenue, which in the case of the oil and gas industry or CCS in particular, would take the form of a signed or executed offtake arrangement for the CO2 that you are capturing. And although our project selection algorithm was centered on data completeness rather than variance, we ended up with a fairly diverse set of 39 projects. The projects were diverse in location in the US, they were diverse in CO2 source, and they were diverse in CO2 end use. And I'm now going to present one result from this research, our biggest takeaway finding. And this figure shows you the results of our three models, a linear regression on the left, a random forest algorithm uh, on, in the middle, and an expert derived weighting of the importance of different variables on the right. So this is the expert model that I mentioned. The dependent variable in each case is project outcome and the 12 independent variables are listed on the left here. 
And the models turned out to rhyme, which was very gratifying. For example, all said that capital cost was quite important. All said that technology readiness was a significant factor in success or failure. All said that the credibility of revenues was an important variable too. And being able to show this through multiple methods is a novel contribution to the literature. But there were two main areas of disagreement. First, two of the models said that the credibility of incentives was important, the linear regression and the expert model, whereas the random forest model deemed it less important. And second, and the one I'm gonna talk about, is this burden of CO2 disposal, which involves the amount of effort, you can think of it, that needs to go into securing access to the pore space, transporting your CO2 to that storage location, and then monitoring and verifying the fact that it's been stored safely. The experts deemed this a very important variable, but the statistical models discounted it more or less. And I wanna talk about this result briefly because it shows the limitations of empirical assessment. For example, our coding of this attribute relied on the documentary evidence that we could find in the historical record of a project CO2 transportation and disposal plans. We found a lot of evidence outlining disposal plans in well-documented projects, including pipeline routes and access to poor space agreements. The experts stated that the fact that that, that that documentary evidence was even visible to us inherently ignored the groundwork that disposal requires on their part to secure and to retire its risk. And so this finding alone serves as a warning sign to future empirical research on CCS. In other words, the degree of documentation and visibility in the empirical record around features like CO2 disposal is endogenous to your efforts to eliminate the risk. It generates a huge paper trail to try and eliminate that risk and it shows you're doing a good job. I'm sorry for not presenting additional results here in the interest of time. I see I've only got five minutes left. But this research developed a new analytical framework for systematically exploring why certain energy projects succeed while others fail. We applied it in this case to CCS and we focused on the US obviously, but it can be readily adjusted and it can be applied to other low carbon energy technologies or even to other countries. And in the case of US CCS projects, we find that the existing literature has so far been quite myopic when analyzing why CCS projects succeed or fail. And that literature has been grounded in engineering economics. To the extent it integrates public policy or human behavior at all, it does so through discount rates, through carbon pricing, or through exogenous assumptions. And I'd like to argue that there are other factors that matter and other factors that can be assessed to some extent, factors like credibility of revenues, credibility of incentives, which matter more to developers in some cases than just technological readiness or just the location of your project. And the reason for conducting assessments like these is because we don't know when the next major push or the next window on CCS will come. There are indications in the US that it will come soon. The Biden administration certainly seems to be interested in fixing the problems of CCS. And our research helps developers and policymakers avoid the mistakes of the past. It helps them identify clusters of near-term projects that are more likely to succeed. And finally, by defining things like credibility of revenues and credibility of incentives, and by demonstrating how an expert thinks of these variables, it provides a way of extracting useful information from these experts about what's credible and what's not to the people in the room when they're signing the billion dollar check. And that can be communicated to policymakers and it would signal to policymakers whether what they're proposing is credible or less than credible. In both papers that I've presented, my colleagues and I try to integrate policy and even politics in CCS's case into energy system analysis. And I want to take a few minutes to talk about the future now because existing large scale energy system models have a couple of fatal flaws. And the one that I'd really like to work on rectifying is that these models rarely integrate human behavior and political economy. And these two things affect which technologies are supported by government R&D, which technologies are commercialized by industry, which technologies end up being accepted by people and therefore diffuse widely into society. 
And that's because the energy transition, and I can't stress this enough, is a socio-technical transition. And engineers must get comfortable with reaching across that disciplinary divide and optimizing the design of their technologies, not just for efficiency or least cost, but also to accommodate sociopolitical constraints that might exist. And it's only by improving representation of these constraints that energy system engineering models can help us plot pathways that are more sustainable. And I know that sustainability is a very loaded term depending on who you're talking to. And yet here I am expanding the definition of sustainability even further to include broad sociopolitical acceptance. And in that um, field or in that stream, I want to briefly introduce an ongoing research project that is seeking to integrate human behavior and political economy in models of the energy transition. It's very hard to find a technology or cluster in Canada or anywhere in the world around which highly charged politics are not competing, but are aligned. And in fact, the lack of political appetite and the lack of political alignment is one of the main constraints to decarbonization using some technologies like wind or nuclear. Fortuitously for Canada, hydrogen seems to fall into that category. It is rare for multiple different provinces to see a role for themselves in any transition. And yet in 2020, the federal government published a hydrogen strategy for Canada, which you can see on the upper right here. The Maritimes developed a feasibility study for hydrogen. Quebec proposed to employ some of its excess hydropower for hydrogen. And Alberta sees a role for itself, a clear role for hydrogen in its energy future. And that is why I, along with a few colleagues here at Carleton, are really excited about developing a large scale energy system model to characterize the potential deployment of hydrogen in Canada's future energy system. And in addition to a network optimization model of the Canadian electric power and natural gas systems, this model would be rooted in human behavior and political economy. So to represent human behavior, we will conduct surveys and integrate attitudes to hydrogen in our diffusion models. As for political economy, the model would be designed to answer questions like the ones you see on the slide. For example, what measures are required to compensate losers in a hydrogen transition? Can we configure the transition in such a way that there are few losers, if any? Um, can a hydrogen economy be more equitable because it's more distributed and sustainable? What are the implications of dedicating huge amounts of land to hydrogen production and putting up huge amounts of renewable power to power that hydrogen generation? And finally, how will it affect the electric power system on which it will rely? And so you can think of that slide as both a teaser for my next talk, as well as an invitation for you to join us in our work. And with that, I'd like to stop again. Thank you for your patience and invite your questions. Thank you, Professor Abdullah, for that insightful and informative talk. Um, so as Professor Abdullah did mention, it's question and answer time. So thank you to everyone who has submitted questions via the Q&A box. It is not too late to do so if you feel inclined or have a question. All right, we're gonna start with our first question. So doesn't framing climate change as a crisis increase the odds of bad decisions being made? How do we use the crisis narrative to stimulate action while reducing the probability of making bad decisions? It can certainly be used to make bad decisions. And so the goal is not to use the crisis framing as an excuse to, to, uh, to advocate for any action. It is rather to say that we are running out of time and what we used to consider less than cost-effective pathways 10 years ago, like DAC, are now within the range of the feasible and in fact need to be deployed aggressively for us to get anywhere. So I, I appreciate the notion that yes, Decision-making, like I said at the beginning, at speed is seldom sensible. At the same time, I think one of the reasons for inaction is that very few of us recognize the scale of the challenge, even the people working in this field. And it's not, it's, it is worse in my estimation to avoid talking about the urgency of the challenge because that might lead to a couple of bad decisions. Great, thank you. Right, next question. Can you speak a bit more to the range of assumptions in your models about the scale of decarbonization of global energy systems that happen in tandem with the different levels of DAC and how they affect one another? Yes, 
so that we don't model the energy system decarbonization ourselves uh, because that tandem decarbonization is uh, already modeled as part of the integrated assessment models which are generated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Suffice to say, we are talking about the yellow cluster, that uh, the yellow and blue clusters that I showed in my first slides, if you remember. So we're talking about getting to net zero or net negative emissions by 2100. That's the scale of the challenge. And according to the International Energy Agency, just to give you a flavor, uh, that scale is equivalent to world GDP. It is between 70 and $80 trillion of investment. All right, next question. Suppose we're successful and DAC is rolled out broadly and effectively, how will we Best, or sorry, how will we best sequester all the carbon that comes out of the machines? I mean, until it's buried underground, our job isn't done yet? Absolutely, it's not done yet. So we do incorporate the cost of sequestration into our model, but we do not tell you where to bury it because that's a charged question. I would say that in terms of the available sequestration, that far exceeds the cumulative capture from now to 2100 that we envision. That's on the range of 2000 gigatons. The available pore space for sequestration is between 1000 and 13,000 tons of CO2 worth of sequestration just in the US. Canada obviously has rich pore space as well, especially in Western Canada. Um, however, that notion of CO2 leakage is also being worked on at the fundamental level. And there might be some leakage, there will be need for aggressive monitoring of any sequestered carbon. We're starting to recognize that, but it's certainly nowhere near a big enough problem for it to be an excuse to rolling out, an excuse for not rolling out DAC. In the scenario where we reverse global warming, what is the contribution of DAC versus that of decarbonization? That's a very good question. I wish I could go back to the slide. Um, the, without DAC, you would still see warm, warming of about two degrees Celsius. That's what that scenario was designed to achieve. And so DAC gets you from that warning of, warming of two degrees Celsius to between one and two degrees. So that's the scale of its contribution. Um, consumer behavior and global consumption contributes to a considerable amount of emissions. I agree that 5% of GDP is reasonable as negative impacts of these emissions are costly in the future. What do you think splitting the 5% of GDP to be spent on education into reduction of consumption, incentives into green alternatives, and finally, any DAC initiatives? It is, I mean, it, that's a noble, statement or a noble notion that yes, we should have a broad effort and that percentage of GDP should be dedicated to a, bro a broad effort. Uh, having a clean energy standard, for example, that is global would be wonderful. Um, it's probably unfair or inequitable as well. So we need to be very careful there. Um, there's certainly no excuse for Canada to emit CO2 um, by the year 2100, I can tell you that. Um, as far as education is concerned, we don't know which technologies are amenable to behavioral modifications and which technologies are not. There's a lot of research being done in this space. I'd rather not get into, into this right now. We can take this conversation off the record. Um, for example, with, when it comes to electric vehicles, um, what is their adoption and charging patterns going to look like? Will there be unintended effects from charging overnight in grids that rely heavily on fossil plants at night? This, this is all being analyzed at very great depth, much greater depth than I've looked into it. Um, and to the extent that we need education, the jury is still out on that as well. Yes, we obviously do need education, but the question of, the, of whether just education will get us to make the correct decisions is, um, I'm not sure the answer there would satisfy the questioner. And I would like to point you to a few papers by a professor at um, Yale Law School, Dan Cahan, or Cahan, um, who discusses this point about scientific literacy leading to bad decisions sometimes. Okay. Okay, next question. 
Among the many visions of decarbonization is the vision of a 100% renewable world, one without carbon capture and storage or direct air capture. Isn't that an equally viable vision? And why wouldn't we be spending our time expanding renewables rather than focusing on these technologies? So for two reasons, it is not a viable, but actually for three reasons, it is not as viable a vision as many of the other ones, especially the ones that adopt a broad portfolio. One reason is that it assumes we can convert as much land as we want or as many of the world's resource, natural resources as we want to the task of renewable generation and storage um, manufacturing. That has limitations as well. For example, we've seen wind power face opposition. We've seen solar face opposition. And so not all renewable technologies will be deployable to the extent that the 100% renewable vision um, would like to see. The second reason is that most of the 100% renewable visions require enormous amounts of storage or enormous amounts of hydropower, for example, to balance the system more than is available in many countries and in many cases. And um, so those are two reasons. The third reason is its cost. I say that we need to consider many attributes. One of those is cost, which I don't talk about much and I don't think should dominate our analysis, but getting to 100% renewables is a very different vision from getting to 80 or 70% renewables. The costs rise, not exponentially, but they rise dramatically. Is there any way to use the byproducts of DAX in order to turn a profit, in order to insensitize the large scale deployment of DAX? Indeed, and, and that's been done. The, the Canadian oil and gas industry funded a Carbon X prize, for example, where startups tried to use carbon dioxide to make fancy new products like uh, sneakers. Um, yes, you can do that. Making sneakers is not sustainable and will not take many, many gigatons of carbon dioxide. Um, and there's only so many um, carbonated beverages that we can all drink. So among the many options, many most are not scalable to the extent we'd like them to be. Synthetic fuels is being explored and in fact is being explored aggressively by Carbon Engineering, one of the DAC companies I mentioned. Their um, revenue model or their business case rests on turning the captured CO2 into synthetic fuels, which is something we've known how to do for a hundred years. The question is how to do it in a way that is more competitive, that is competitive with um, fossil hydrocarbons. Okay, we have time for one more question here. So you are suggesting a carbon removal enterprise on the scale of the current energy system. One of the main barriers to deploying infrastructure is public opposition. How will the need for a crisis response clash with this public opposition to de development? completely unknown at this point. Uh, I'll, I'll just take a step back and say, I'm not advocating for a carbon removal enterprise on the scale of the current energy system. I'm saying, if you want to do this aggressively to capture gigatons of carbon a year, this is what you have to do. And this is what you have to spend. Um, public opposition constrains most of the technologies we have. And that is another research project that I'm working on now. How can we integrate public opposition or public acceptance into models of energy deployment? Um, all of these technologies will be captured, will be constrained to that extent. We don't know the extent to which DAC will be yet because it is what Professor David Reiner at the University of Cambridge calls an imaginary technology. We don't know where to go to see DAC yet. And we may end up accepting it broadly or we may end, end up um, opposing it severely, as indeed we do carbon capture and nuclear power in certain jurisdictions. So this, there is no global answer to this. The local political context will determine the extent to which DAC can be deployed in any policy. Wonderful, thank you. And just wanna thank you again, Professor Abdullah for this wonderful talk. We hope that uh, you enjoyed your time with us and sharing your insight and information. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, so two papers that um, Professor Abdullah has mentioned are available in the chat. So those links have been shared.
Um, we're also going to launch our um, survey here. So it's just brief. So if you do have the time to fill it out, uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. So on the screen, there are ways to stay connected with the Faculty of Engineering and Design. So please note that our next Ingenious Talks will take place in April. So for, though, for alumni and those on our Ingenious Talks mailing list, um, please keep an eye out in your inbox for the invitation. And the next online event for the Faculty of Engineering and Design is the Breakthrough Breakfast that will take place on March the 4th as part of Invest Ottawa's International Women's Week initiative here in the capital. So details will be available on our website shortly. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. Keep well, let's stay connected and hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you and have a great day.